This revision video will give you an overview of climatic hazards, so we're going to have a look at tropical storms first, and then we're going to have a look at drought. Okay, so depending on um, the atmospheric um, pressure, so whether we've got low pressure or high pressure, it can determine what the weather is going to be like in an area. So for example, in a low pressure system we have rising air. If we know that if the air is rising and evaporating, it's going to condense to form clouds and we're going to get lots of rain. So in a low pressure system, we generally have quite rainy weather and it can lead to a depression. In a high pressure system, we have the complete opposite. We have the air sinking, so we ha don't have any clouds forming. So the air, the air is generally quite bright and sunny and we have anticyclones. So where do tropical storms happen? Well, there are three main names for tropical storms, but they all mean exactly the same thing. They just form in different oceans. So for example, you can see that hurricanes form in the Atlantic Ocean. Cyclones form in the Indian Ocean and typhoons form in the Pacific Ocean. So because typhoons and hurricanes are in the northern hemisphere, they're going to travel north and sorry, west and then north. And um, cyclones are in the southern hemisphere, so they are going to travel west and then south. Okay, so they're traveling the opposite way because of the Earth's rotation depending on the hemisphere they're in. So what conditions do we need? Well the water needs to be at least 27 degrees or higher. There needs to be uh, 5 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator, so that's talking about the latitude. And the ocean needs to be at least 60 foot deep with strong winds. They form when the water, um, when it's 27 degrees, directs the air direct, sorry, warms the air directly above it. This air rises, we know evaporation is going to condense to form clouds um, and the, they start to rain. Trade winds coming in from either side are going to start to make the storm spin and rotate. And when it picks up enough speed, it's going to travel west because of the easterly winds near the equator. When the hurricane or, trop or tropical storm gets towards land, it's going to start to slow down because the energy supply from the water is cut off. So the characteristics then, if you look first of all at the diagram on the left, you can see a cross section of a hurricane. The eye is in the middle where we've got descending or sinking air. The um, rising air is at either side of that and you can see that it's starting um, to form an eye wall either side of the eye and that is where the winds are going to be the strongest whereas the eye of the storm will be very calm. Um, on the diagram on the right we've got a satellite image, this is what we see coming down from space. You can see the eye of the storm, which is very calm in the centre, is travelling in an anti-clockwise direction and it's a circular shape. Hurricanes, tropical storms, cyclones tend to last between four, 7 and 14 days um, the eye of the storm is about 50 kilometres wide, whereas um, the entire storm itself is between 500 and 2,000 um, kilometres wide. And they can travel up to winds of 160 miles per hour. Per hour. What kind of weather do we get then? Well, this, we tend to get lots of storm clouds and torrential rain, strong winds, so they must be greater than 75 miles an hour to be classed as a hurricane. We get hail, thunder, lightning, and in the eye of the storm we get a very calm, low wind speed. The picture at the bottom right shows a storm surge, that's literally when the hurricane comes into the coastline, it's going to increase the height of the wave and it's going to surge into the coast. Impacts, we've got primary and secondary, same as in tectonic. In primary, the buildings will be destroyed, so people are left homeless and have to live in temporary accommodation. Rivers and coastal areas will flood, so people might drown. The roads and bridges will be destroyed, so emergency services will find it difficult to access the area. Sewage overflows due to flooding and contaminates the water supplies, and crops can be damaged and livestock kills, which could mean there's a lack of food and income. Why are tropical storms more severe in LEDCs? Well, they have poor quality housing, so it's destroyed much more easily. We have poor infrastructure, so it's hard for emergency services to access people there. More people depend on the farming lifestyle in LEDCs in rural areas, so when the crops are destroyed, it's, they're going to lose their livelihood and have not any not have any food or money. Um, they also have less money to protect themselves in terms of flood defences like levees and the healthcare is worse so they can't cope with the amount of people who need assistance. People still tend to live in these areas though because they have always lived there and it would mean moving away from their family and friends. They work in the area so they, wouldn't find, so they would find it very difficult to find a new job and they don't think it would happen again so it's going to be safe to live there. And finally, they are confident that the government will give them support after the hazard in rebuilding their house. We can reduce the impact of tropical storms by tracking them using satellite and radar images. The diagram in this, um, in this slide is a radar image. 
and it, you can see where the hurricane is going to be moving towards. Um, it can change the track, but generally we're able to work out where it will hit. Uh, we can avoid building in places most at risk, so on the coast, which will reduce the risk of flooding. Um, governments can plan evacuation routes, and we can educate people on how to prepare with emergency packs of food and water. The strength of a hurricane is measured on a scale called the Sapphire Simpson Hurricane Scale. We can, we can see that in Category 1, the wind speed is quite low at only 74 miles per hour. Moving through to Category 5, we can see that the wind speed pick up to uh, 155 miles per hour and the damage uh, therefore gets a lot worse in Stage 5. Drought then is a period, as a long period, so weeks, months or years when rainfall is going to be below average. So depending on where you live, below average is going to vary. Um, the longest drought in the UK was when we didn't have a, we, we had below average rainfall for 16 months, whereas in Ethiopia the below average rainfall has been lasting for 10 years. Drought is caused when we've got a um, high pressure system, so we've got anticyclones forming, we've got really um, hot sun in the summer, um, which means we get a lot of evapotranspiration, which is the sum of evaporation and transpiration. So all the water is lost into the atmosphere and we, it's not on the ground anymore. We also get very few clouds forming, which leads to less precipitation. You need to be able to describe the distribution um, using a map to show where drought is happening. So in this map, you can see that we've got a lot of drought in northeastern Africa, in the Sahel region, in southern Africa, Middle East Australia, parts of South America and Indonesia. Why do people live in areas affected by drought then? Well, same as for the hurricanes. Um, people have always lived there and they don't want to live their family. People have a job in the area and it might be difficult to find one elsewhere and they don't think it's going to happen again. We call this inertia. Impacts. The primary impacts are going to be that crops will die, so therefore there will be a shortage of food and people will die from starvation. Animals will die due to lack of vegetation, so people will die because they don't have any food. Fish will die because the rivers and lakes dry up, which means there are conflicts over water supplies. And the soils will dry out, which makes them more easily eroded, and this can lead to desertification when the ground becomes like a desert. So how do humans make drought worse? Well, by overgrazing, by allowing cows and cattle to overgraze an area, it means that there's no vegetation, that means the grass and the plants left, um, and if, if they're not there to, to bind the soil together, when, it, when the wind blows, it's going to erode the top layer of soil, which will lead to desertification. Excessive irrigation, so that's when water is supplied from lakes um, to the farmland to help the crops. If we do that too much, there's not going to be enough water left in the rivers and the lakes when we get to, to a drought. Drought is more severe in LEDCs because generally people depend on farming. So if the crops die, so does their livestock and they're going to lose their livelihood to their income and they are likely to starve. LEDCs also have less money to prepare for droughts or respond to them, so they can't afford to build reservoirs and store water like the ones in this picture, which means that when drought happens, they don't have a backup. So we can reduce the impacts of drought in both MEDCs and LEDCs. In MEDCs, we're able to manage, monitor the rainfall and river levels, and we're also able to reduce the amount of water we use at home, so using showers instead of baths, perhaps we put in place a hose pipe ban, and we could build a reservoir to collect rainwater. In LEDCs, not all of these things are possible or necessary. Um, we can grow drought resistant crops like olives, so we are looking at farming techniques and making sure that we are able to still have sustenance. We could increase water supplies by building a well to collect rainwater, and we could receive aid, emergency aid like food and water, and long term development aid like building wells. Most of the methods are sustainable and they're environmentally friendly and effective. There's two negatives of building um, reservoirs and wells. Um, reservoirs can reduce the amount of water available for people further down the river, and building a well can reduce the groundwater supply, so there will be less water available in the future.